Welcome back to Hero Journal 120. I am Jeff Clint, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Virginia as part of a computer science degree. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Descartes again. Uh, we already had kind of one video on him, so you know th this is two videos on one guy in this series, so that, that's kind of a, a big deal, isn't it? I mean, he, he must have been important if I'm bringing this much attention on him. Because remember, I only did three on calculus, and so this is kind of a pre-calculus mathematician, so uh, it may be a clue of how important I consider this guy that I've devoted so much time to him. Uh, but a as kind of described in the, in the last video on him, he is a little bit difficult to describe, uh, because unless you're kind of really stuck in an ivory tower somewhere, uh, you're probably not that much into Aristotelian thought. Uh, and you really haven't got the baggage that the Western world had developed by the time that Descartes had come around uh, that required so much overturning that Descartes ended up providing, uh, some of which he did personally in his works, some of which he didn't publish and just kind of inspired other people to do on his behalf, or even uh, not on his behalf, as we'll kind of get into here. Uh, but his ideas have become a lot closer to what we would consider common sense uh, than his predecessors would have been. And so, unfortunately, it's hard to describe how important it is because it just seems obvious uh, that, of course, there are atoms, and of course that they behave in a certain way. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can build our worldview on very basic things uh, that he would have struggled very much uh, to develop. Again, which we'll get into in a bit. Uh, and so, not only that, but as science has changed over the cen centuries since him, uh, we find different things valuable about what he did and his ideas. So I don't necessarily want to be kind of focused on one thing uh, rather than just the, the, the large scope of things that he was involved with, uh, because history will uh, probably, if it's any, or if the future is anything like our history. Uh, we'll probably still think that he did very important things, but we'll probably continue to disagree what exactly he did that was important. Uh, so, for example, in the uh, up until about the 18th century, uh, his kind of method was viewed as important. Uh, it, but until about the 19th century, his view about animals and their psychology was kind of important, and his mathematics are still kind of important to this day. So he would have lived from. Fifteen ninety six to sixteen fifty, and just to give kind of a scope of what exactly does that mean, kind of compare and contrast that with Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, which would have been born just kind of after him, uh, Isaac Newton, which would have been born kind of very late in his life, Leibniz also kind of very very late in his life, uh, Galileo, uh, fifteen sixty four to sixteen forty two, so he's practically a contemporary. Uh, the Three Musketeers uh, kind of fictional works happen in about 1627, uh, which is notable in, in why we'll kind of get into it in a bit. Uh, but most notable, of course, is the Isaac Newton and Leibniz kind of being born really late into his life, and uh, the, the way that you know Descartes was preparing the world for them. He was preparing mathematics, and the way that they ended up kind of changing the world, uh, a lot of that was because he, he made the, the headway that allowed them to do that. So he was a Catholic. Uh, he lived much as much of his life in Protestant countries uh, like the Netherlands and Sweden. Uh, but he, he kind of lived all over Europe and was involved with a lot of things on the continent uh, during his life. Uh, he would have gotten his degree and license to practice religious law uh, from the university, if I'm pronouncing it correct, Poitiers or Poit. Uh, either way, uh, by about 1618, he went to the Netherlands, volunteering in the army in the Netherlands at the time. Uh, 1619, after kind of doing that, he met one Isaac Beekman, uh, who inspired him to get more involved with mathematics and science, uh, up to and including Democritus' uh, atomic theory, um, which wasn't necessarily heretical at the time, but uh, was certainly not the most popular view of how things worked. Uh, and he wrote something, uh, which I haven't read, called, quote, Compendium Musicae, uh, which, although it was kind of a paper on music, uh, music was kind of considered as part of math, so that was kind of considered a math paper. Uh, by about 1620, uh, he 
was continuing to move in that direction and started to look for a new method to approach science with and a new way of looking at the world uh, to kind of take into account uh, the kind of changing uh, evidence that was being presented uh, from sources such as Galileo and his kind of finding the, the moons uh, surrounding Jupiter. Uh, all the while, he was continuing to experiment uh, and found, or seems to have found the law of ref refraction uh, in optics. It was really in 1626. So he would have been traveling around Europe from 1620 to 28, uh, in particular uh, visiting this siege of Rochelle. Uh, led by one Cardinal Richelieu, which again was kind of the backdrop for the Three Musketeers. Um, so if you go read that, that this is kind of the, the frame of the, the world uh, that was kind of happening at the time. Uh, in 1629, so really not that far after that, uh, he started writing what Le Monde, or The World, an attempt to kind of have a worldview or a physics-based uh, textbook that could describe many things about how the world worked without appealing to Aristotle and kind of the ancient wisdom that was kind of commonly taught at the time. This would have included heliocentrism. But Galileo at the time was getting in a lot of trouble for doing practically the same thing on a smaller scale. Uh, and so he mostly just kept his work to himself and didn't publish, didn't really release all that much details to the, to the greater world, even though he was uh, in a place that had relative uh, religious freedom and might have been able to get further than Galileo did on that particular topic. Uh, but nevertheless, he kind of kept it to himself. Uh, 1634, he wrote uh, Dioptic, uh, a paper on optics and on meteors, which again was kind of a popular uh, topic for people to look into, uh, even though his particular take on it was kind of risque, uh, as well as geometry, a text, a kind of text on geometry, uh, as well as a preface that was attached to each of those three works, uh, which ended up becoming the kind of method that he used to approach things, which was discussed in the last video. Uh, the optics uh, paper, dioptic, wasn't so much groundbreaking in content, but how it came to its conclusions was a little bit, uh, because of the method that he used to find things out. It was a very kind of scientific type of approach. And so this alone, the fact that he was approaching something like optics from that direction was kind of new. Uh, some people say that like the geometry uh, work is his most important work that he ever wrote. Uh, I haven't read it personally, so I can't judge one way or the other. Uh, I, I kind of view his meditations as kind of important, which is of course the next thing in 1639. Uh, where he basically uh, wrote, he, he described his method in the, the, those initial works, and then he gave it to the, the learned people of his times uh, to basically give him criticism, and then he answered the criticism of it. So again, he's already kind of using this kind of feedback approach of correcting his errors, of, of remedying his ignorance, and kind of trying to, to see if there's anything about what he believes uh, that can be corrected by other people. So he's kind of spreading the work of uh, finding where he's mistaken uh, to other smart people and gaining the, the, the usefulness of their minds in addition to his. Uh, so he would have received replies from, among other people, uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, which is kind of a, a, a one of the great thinkers of his time. Uh, another thing to note, in particular, about the meditations on first philosophy, uh, is that around this time, uh, European ships uh, were carrying about according to one website, at least 100,000 tons of silver to China uh, every year. Uh, and so this is kind of an important detail because Europe was in contact with China to an increasing degree by this time. And some of the uh, kind of great minds of Chinese history uh, were finally starting to get translated and people like Descartes may have or probably did have access to uh, thinkers from China, uh, or at least some of their thought, uh, in, in ways that their predecessors really didn't have. Uh, and so when he approaches things from the perspective of kind of meditating on them and kind of viewing things as though the received wisdom from the Western side uh, is fallible, uh, part of this is because some of the evidence of what or how they view the world 
it was coming in conflict with the same kind of, or the uh, ways of looking at the world from the Chinese side. And although history doesn't really record it all that well, uh, there's no doubt that at least some of his ideas uh, were already kind of common knowledge, or, or at least uh, not that uh, remarkable from view from the perspective of Chinese philosophy. And so he just I imported, at least to some extent, some ways of looking at things. Uh, how much, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on you know, Chinese philosophy history. Uh, but there, there's certainly some of that going on. And so medita meditation itself as part of that uh, is kind of an important detail. Uh, and that, that was a core part of kind of calming the self and viewing things in a, a detached and dispassionate way uh, so that you could get to the truth. That, again, was, a, at, the, at the time at least, uh, very, uh, I guess, related to that particular uh, aspect of things. Um, and of course it's related to the great point of Combine in that we have, we remember him in a certain way uh, as, you know, Europe was kind of a backwater at the time. The, the whole continent was at war uh, and so we, we kind of remember what is written down in English and French uh, uh, to a large extent, but it's you know, easy to take credit for things that are happening across the world in 500 years in the past uh, when there's nobody kind of questions it at the time, which, again, that was probably going on to some extent. Uh, by the 1640s, uh, one of his kind of former protégés, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Henricus Regulus, uh, kind of apparently took a lot of Descartes' ideas and what he knew and had learned from Descartes and started to argue uh, in directions that Descartes would have never anticipated. Uh, this was going to be a reoccurring trend, uh, although this was kind of unique in that it was happening during his life. And so he was already doing things that were strange enough and getting results that were strange enough from the religious worldview perspective that Descartes had to like publicly denounce the guy as being totally wrong. It's like, no, 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 even though you totally followed my method to the T, uh, you're, you're still wrong, right? Uh, and he kind of was forced to do that. So that, that's kind of like a, a very broad overview of his life, uh, which, I mean, you can get a lot more details by going to you know, your Wikipedia or whatever, but just is, is kind of to frame the, 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 the view of why uh, or what was happening at the time uh, so that you can kind of understand the, the impact of these inventions, of these things that he came up with. Things like our view of how to express exponential numbers. So like the two to the third video. This way of doing exponential numbers is his idea. Uh, the fact that we do it this way, again, that's, that's his work uh, and has kind of set the, the standard for centuries afterwards. Cartesian coordinates, things you learn in high school, like having two axes where one is one dimension represented by a number line, another is another dimension represented by a number line. This is his idea. He came up with this. It was, it was not done before he kind of started doing it, um, which is kind of allowed for us to view uh, a lot of different kinds of problems in math in ways that were never possible before he did this. He found the law of conservation of momentum, another kind of extremely important uh, result in physics, and which would have led uh, future thinkers to come up with the or conservation of other kinds of things such as energy. Uh, so like the, the laws of thermodynamics were just out of reach. Uh, he was close, he didn't quite get to them again. Would he have been able to get to them had he not censored his results, fearing that he would become another Galileo? Hard to tell. Either way, he found the conservation of the momentum law uh, and kind of paved that path for us. Uh, he tied algebra and geometry together. At the time, geometry was seen as the math. Uh, so if you proved something and you didn't use geometry, there was some doubt in your proof because it just wasn't geometric. Uh, whereas by his time, he was able to show that uh, there was kind of this relationship between the two. Although like most people of his time, he still saw geometry as the kind of main or true math and as algebra is just kind of a shorthand for it. Today we kind of view things the opposite way, or at least how it's normally taught in high schools and math classes around the world, we normally kind of learn the algebra side 
and then kind of view the, the geometry side as a, a, a application of it or a way of viewing what we're doing, uh, when, again, he would have viewed it the complete opposite way around. And the part of the reason that we view it this way is because he allowed us to. Uh, the idea of rationalism, of, of as opposed to empiricism, is, again, a split that started with his way of looking at things. Um, so uh, Leibniz and Spinoza, uh, although they, they didn't directly uh, use his methods specifically, uh, they, they really did kind of draw from it uh, in a way that would have opposed thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Uh, on secrecy, quote, uh, he kept his address a secret and changed locations fr frequently in, in accordance to his motto, who lives well hidden, lives well, unquote. So this is a guy who, again, has traveled Europe and has survived through multiple wars, through multiple kind of religious clashes, and has kind of managed to thrive in a very chaotic and violent world. Uh, and part of how he did this is by keeping hidden and keeping kind of even though he was a high-profile person, uh, not necessarily keeping high-profile uh, as far as where he was specifically. Uh, so he would have been as successful as he was in part because of that. Um, he wrote a uh, text on the, quote, passions of the soul, uh, kind of making headway into psychology and uh, understanding emotions as kind of an early steps towards that. Um, he was one of the things he did was kind of he reformulated our view on how matter exists and that it exists on its own. Aristotelians believed that matter existed because it was participating in the form that it was, uh, there were these kind of forms that existed and that you couldn't have matter that didn't, ex or that didn't kind of interact or participate in that form. And in particular, that earth matter always flows towards the center of the universe. Uh, and so kind of it was a, a one-two step in freeing matter itself from kind of being viewed in this Copernican way, uh, of one step of which was to kind of free it from the, this necessary reliance on its form, which he did. Uh, and it's worth noting that both the Catholics and the Protestants at this time, or at his time, supported the Aristotelian view uh, and so he would have kind of broken free of both of those ways of looking at things. Uh, he specifically wanted to keep his books on physics to be taught at school, uh, but they were banned by the church, so that kind of made it difficult. Um, as mentioned, he found the law of refraction. Uh, he would have viewed the beginning of the universe uh, as a chaotic soup of particles in motion, uh, and that everything that formed after that, quote, uh, was subsequently formed as a result of patterns that developed within this moving matter, unquote. So again, this is a very modern view of how the universe began. Uh, and so he wouldn't have, you know, thought about things in terms of, say, the Big Bang, uh, but that's a lot closer to the Big Bang than, say, the Adam and Eve story. Uh, he originated what's called the mind-body problem, uh, although his solution to it is by no means uh, accepted by uh, kind of most modern thinkers, including myself. Uh, the problem remains a valid problem and haunts artificial intelligence and other areas to this day. Um, he also found what's called Descartes' rule of signs, a uh, method of counting zeros of a function. Uh, he, he was the first to measure the angular radius of a rainbow. Something so simple as a rainbow had up until his point uh, kind of eluded empirical study. Uh, and so we understand rainbows, at least in part because of his work. Uh, and so, in addition to kind of all these things and laying the foundation for industrial revolution, uh, the fact that he, he invented these things is important, but what's more important is that it's, it was possible for him to do so because of his reframing of what was possible to do with your mind. And that kind of reframing uh, emboldened him to do so uh, and to find these things. Uh, he's related to some of the other videos, as kind of mentioned before. Uh, he's related to the Occam's Razor video, uh, among other reasons, because his kind of viewing of how planets and stars were uh, kind of related to each other uh, involved kind of these spinning vortexes, which again is not the modern way of looking at things, but in his time seemed a lot more likely than their 
being kind of nothing separate planets, or nothing separating planets, that we're still interacting with each other with kind of spooky action at a distance, a gravity happening. Uh, so that would have been kind of like an active application of Hawking's razor, that there's at least there's something going on uh, to, to take steps towards understanding how gravity works that Newton, of course, would later do. Uh, as kind of mentioned, it's related to the epistemology and AI video, because he would have been very interested in how we can best learn things, how we currently learn things, and kind of the difference between those two things. Uh, he would have been interested in not just what reality is actually like, but the method that you could actually come to know what the answer to that question was. Uh, he would have also been interested in what's called, quote, or what he called, uh, material falsity, uh, where you're v you view such things as cold as things. Uh, when they're really absences of things, or really just kind of high-level uh, interpretations of lower-level things like movement uh, or, or heat. Uh, is related to the Proverbs video, because there is plenty of his quotes that are still floating around the web to this day uh, that kind of encapsulate things that he would have thought. Uh, quote, I think, therefore, I am. Quote, perfect numbers are like perfect men are very rare. Uh, quote, there is nothing so strange and unbelievable that it has not been said by at least one philosopher or another, unquote. I.e., you know, there, there's all these things that you could think of, uh, and you shouldn't be surprised that someone has come up with it before. Although we, of course, now know a little bit more about that particular topic, thanks to complexity theory, regardless. Uh, it's obviously related to the Dark Descartes Method video, being that this is the guy who came up with it, uh, in that he would have kind of viewed things as or view problems that you couldn't solve uh, in such a way that you would divide and conquer them, and that you would create order in doing things, uh, and in general, kind of keeping a list of problems that you can't solve and come back to them. And again, I, I kind of discussed how that works with my to-do list, but you know, five or even 50 years down the road, you may find something that you wanted to solve, and it's suddenly you know, solvable uh, and trivial where it was at the time that you encountered it, uh, not nearly as much so. On the contrary, sometimes when you're stuck, uh, you can kind of go back and see uh, anything else that you could have solved or could have been solving uh, if you had the solution to that. Um, the uh, it would have been related to the all the uh, data video because he would have said to quote omit nothing uh, to basically make sure that when you come up with a way of viewing things uh, that you're you're comprehensive about it. You know, don't commit the Texas sharpshooter fallacy related to the argument from silence video because he's an interesting possible possible even an exception in that he deals uh, at least to start with with the the kind of way of getting started on having knowledge from nothing so he, he would have been kind of viewing things as you start from silence what can you do from there uh, and he had answers for that it's not really worth getting into them but it, it's interesting to note that that is one of the things that he would have tried to do it's related to the is ought uh, fallacy and the is video and the fate video because realistically he had a theory of how to break the is ought problem by appealing to the quote virtuous god uh, for to do so for him. You know, and that's not a very good way of dealing with that problem, but at least he gives that problem some thought and you know got that far at it. Uh, and likewise, he would have not accepted that it's inevitable that he's going to accept a falsehood, and that he, he, he kind of would view things that it's always possible to believe only true things, uh, and that you at least have the free will necessary to do that, uh, which is better than nothing. Uh, it's related to the deduction and induction videos, because Descartes would have been very in favor of deductive reasoning, uh, so certain conclusions that you could draw but again, was not afraid of experiment. He conducted many experiments and came up with laws that described his results based on them. Uh, but he would have been kind of viewing things in terms of trying to find knowledge that was certain. Uh, it's related to the derivatives video because, uh, as kind of mentioned, Descartes was critical in how we came to our conception of derivatives, both from the geometry side and the algebra side. Uh, Newton viewed things in terms of geography. Geometry, just as it, Descartes did, uh, but still, being able to view, look at things from both directions made it significantly easier for calculus to be invented and for the entire rest of science to be built on it. So, uh, hopefully that's at least 
some clue as far as why Descartes was important, why we should remember him, why we kind of view him as smart as he was uh, in retrospect and as someone who's to this day uh, impacting the world with his body. Uh, as usual, if you have any questions about Descartes and his ideas, uh, feel free to ask. I'm not a you know, historian of science, but uh, I can certainly uh, try to field some questions on his works. Uh, and uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address in the bottom somewhere where you can support this video series. Um, I can definitely use uh, some of your support if you're enjoying this series. And uh, hope to see you at the next video. I will see you then.